Hello, I'm George Liston CA. Welcome to Dialogue, a program that explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. They were the astronauts of their day, the men who dared to explore the world's Arctic regions at the dawn of the 20th century captured the public's imagination. Nearly 800 of them sacrificed their lives in late 19th century attempts to reach the North Pole. When the Pole was reached in 1909, it generated awe and controversy. And while it made Admiral Robert Perry a natural hero, little regard was given to Matthew Henson, Perry's self-professed indispensable companion, and the man who actually reached the Pole first. The images now on your screen and the sounds you hear suggest the character of Matthew Henson and the cruel challenge of Arctic exploration. That Henson was an African-American born in the wake of the Civil War and a man of enormous courage and talent makes his true story an indispensable chapter in American history and American race relations. My guest is Dr. Edna Green Medford, Associate Professor and Director of Graduate Studies in the Department of History at Howard University. Dr. Medford, welcome to Dialogue. Thank you. I really welcome this conversation because uh, not only is this man heroic, but I think you can acquaint us with the kinds of things he had to overcome to be a hero. Mm -hmm. And maybe you could first help us understand um, the age itself, the, the spirit of the age. Uh, we're going to talk about Matthew Henson in particular. His name is linked to Robert Perry. There are other names, Bird, Scott, Amundsen. Ernest Shackleton, mm -hmm. all of those men in that period, um, in my mind, was kind of an era of magnificent obsession, this idea that the pole had to be reached. Mm -hmm. um, I think of it as a kind of a combination of romantic adventure and scientific curiosity. How would you characterize that, that period in which they did what they did? I think that's a good characteri characterization. Uh, these were men who saw that there was a challenge and were more than willing to, to meet that challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, Matthew Henson had an even greater challenge, however, because he was an African American. Mm -hmm. And he's living in a time and dreaming about polar exploration in a time at a time when African Americans are seen as inferior to whites. Mm -hmm. uh, remember that we're, we're less than half a century uh, out of slavery mm -hmm. by this time. And so it's a horrific period in the history uh, of African Americans. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Rayford Logan, who uh, had taught at Howard for a number of years, called the, the era the nadir. Uh, you know, it starts in the 1870s, and it actually goes right up to 1915 or so. Right. And so he's really attempting to do the these things at a time when it really is a low point in African American yeah. history. I, I deeply appreciate that because uh, the other men I mentioned didn't have to contend with that. I mean, Absolutely. they all had plenty to contend with in terms of nature's challenge. But this particular political, social, cultural challenge that faced Matthew Henson, I think is something that may be new to many of the people viewing. And I, you're a specialist in 19th century African American uh, history, yes, uh, Dr. Yes, Medford. Mm -hmm. I'd love for you to expound a bit on this. Uh, he was born, Matthew Henson, 1866. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what was the world like? And that's one year after the Civil War mm -hmm. ends, mm -hmm. and he's coming mm -hmm. into it. Exactly. Well, and in Calvert County, close to where we are right yes, now. Yes, just, just about 45 miles south of Washington. Right. Uh, his parents were sharecroppers mm -hmm. early on. He's, he was born into poverty. Uh, his parents had been freeborn, mm -hmm. but that didn't make a great deal of difference. There wasn't a great deal of opportunity in the period after the Civil War for African right. Americans, especially not in Southern Maryland, mm -hmm. where there had been uh, such a tremendous hold on, uh, that slavery had on the economy and on the social life of the people as well. Mm -hmm. So Henson and his family would have had great odds to overcome in right. Southern Maryland, as did many African Americans throughout the South. Yeah. But he would not have been had much formal education. I believe he had six years of formal education. Mm -hmm. And this is a man who, by the time he was 12 or 13, left home, went to Baltimore, associated himself with a sea captain, mm -hmm. and traveled around the world. It's I, absolutely extraordinary. And I appreciate that when I get into that uh, that key period. I think he was uh, yeah, 11 years old or something like that when he set out on his own, as far as I can determine, mm -hmm. to, to accomplish all that he did. There is one uh, curious fact, which may not be a fact, so you're the person <laughs> to ask about this, but. I think I've either read or heard somewhere that there's uh, some believe there's some connection between his, the Henson family 
and the cabin that ended up being uh, uh, the Josiah Henson Josiah Henson cabin yeah. is that was Th that a relative that, that really has not been established there's mm -hmm. been some speculation that he is a distant relative of Josiah Henson who who supposedly is the person mm -hmm. that Uncle Tom's cabin was whose right. life Uncle Tom's cabin was patterned after mm -hmm. but I don't think that has been really determined for right. sure I mean yeah. there's speculation but there's nothing that's that's certain about that we can treat that as a colorful detail which may or may not be true <laughs> In life that already right. has enough Absolutely. going for it. Absolutely. Speaking of this life having things going for it, uh, I can this I can visualize this lad of 11 years of age coming into the Baltimore Harbor, I suppose, mm -hmm. and um, in my imagination at least, I see him coming toward the, the uh, schooners that must have been mm -hmm. uh, birthed there, mm -hmm. coming up to one, the Katie Hines, mm -hmm. and this is the ship that Captain. Childs, mm -hmm. uh, okay. masters, right. and now this is an interesting relationship because, and I would love to get your your take on it, that the Childs would take him on. Um, must have been extraordinary for its time. Absolutely. Well, he's he's taken on as a cabin boy mm -hmm. initially, so right. that's not unusual. Mm -hmm. But what is unusual is the amount of attention that the captain gave to him because he really did teach him. Mm -hmm. He trained him how to navigate, and so that man had a very important influence on Henson's mm -hmm. life right. early on. All right. Mathematics and navigation are sciences that the young Matthew Henson begins to perfect. Mm -hmm. And with the Katie Hines and perhaps other ships as well, he really does, at this very early age and through his youth, get around the world, doesn't he? He certainly does. Yeah. You know, he travels to the Far East, he go, and then he goes to Spain and to France, and, and he goes to southern Russia as well. Mm -hmm. So he's seen quite a bit of the world. Right. But, but he's not that unusual in the sense that there are lots of black mariners. I think yeah. we, we forget that. We forget that black men had always been aboard mm -hmm. ship. Mm -hmm. And so it wouldn't be so unusual for a black boy of 11 or 12 to dream of mm -hmm. going to sea. And keep in mind, too, that being at sea gives a certain amount of freedom. Yes. And so uh, I can imagine that someone like Henson who could dream of things greater than being in the, the tobacco fields, yeah. you know, that he would want that kind of adventure. Yeah. And so that experience led him to want to experience more. Right. And so he ends up at the North Pole as a consequence. And, 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 which we're definitely going to get to because that is the height <laughs> of our story. But I think you make a very valuable point because uh, in the annals of not just American history but world history, black mariners are an extraordinarily significant Absolutely. part. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I do believe that at one point the American Navy, which later became one of the more bigoted of the services and, <laughs> and, and segregated, was uh, comparatively free or at least mm -hmm. allowed much more mobility for its well, black well, it's, members. It's very difficult to segregate aboard ship. Exactly. <laughs> so exactly. the Army can do it, the Navy mm -hmm. couldn't do it quite as easily. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that mm -hmm. black men were not disadvantaged in the Navy, but certainly not to the same extent as they were in the mm -hmm. Army. And you know, as, as you may recall, there were all of these issues by the time of the Civil War about whether or not black men should serve in the Army. Army, but they were already serving in the Navy. That's so precisely that the point. The I was trying, exactly. And in the British Navy, just to put a fine point on it, in the 18th century there were several black captains of, of smaller vessels mm -hmm. at least. Exactly. So it, it, it's quite a story in itself. Matthew Henson is one of these men as a sailor uh, with the tutelage of child and then of course his own genius for mastering these topics. Does he gain official credentials? Does he sort of progress in what he's doing aboard ship, becoming, for example, the uh, demonstrating the navigational skills that are going to be so important mm -hmm. to Perry. Well, well, he starts as a cabin boy, of, of course, but in about four years or so, or well, well, after four years of traveling around mm -hmm. the world, he does become an experienced seaman. Mm -hmm. He doesn't go beyond that, however, so mm -hmm. he doesn't get any title, as I understand mm -hmm. it. Just He never becomes a captain right. or anything of that sort, as, I, as far as I know. Yeah, but he certainly gets the knowledge. Huh? He really does, mm -hmm. and it's that knowledge that he gains on board ship and the confidence and the courage as well that enables him to do this extraordinary thing later. Absolutely. And you know, um, I think we should introduce now the man who's going to be his partner in the extraordinary thing he does because the two lives, which begin to obviously um, uh, relate at, at this early point, are quite distinctive. And I'm, Absolutely. of course, speaking of uh, uh, Robert Edwin Perry. Mm -hmm. Now, Perry, Dr. Medford, uh, white, of course, uh, I understood was born in Pennsylvania but raised largely in Maine. Right, right. Graduated from Bowdoin College, a leading institution then and now, mm -hmm. and becomes a naval engineer. Mm -hmm. um, what you, in contrast to what 
Henson's world was like. Mm -hmm. What's your sense of what Perry's late 19th century middle class world was like? Very different. Mm -hmm. uh, much more privileged. Um, a bit of a spoiled existence. I think he was probably a bit smothered by his mother, mm -hmm. uh, but but he had a very different existence mm -hmm. from Henson. Uh, the world was open to him. He could do whatever he wanted, dream whatever he wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was amazed, you know, at the the amount of time he can take off from the Navy to do these polar expeditions. It's just incredible. I'm interested <laughs> to hear you say that because, I mean, as a lay reader and not a historian, I mean, it's the accounts I read, I kept wondering, how could he do this? Because, you know, he, he had an important rank, but a comparatively low, uh, mm -hmm. albeit an officer's rank. Mm -hmm. right. And he exactly. seemed to have a lot of leeway to do these kinds of things. Well, 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 I think it may have to do as well with how important the work he was attempting to do uh -huh. was. You know, mm -hmm. no one had, had done it before. No one had been successful. And so he did get a lot of encouragement because people wanted to see it happen. Yeah. You know? And yeah. so I think that that was part of it. But also, too, he had certain connections, I'm sure, that made right. it possible for him to do that. Uh, because what you're alluding to here, I think, or stating uh, uh, quite openly, there were a number of expeditions that he conducted. Absolutely. And I think you're emphasizing the scientific importance that was mm -hmm. given to the kind of thing he was, he was at. Okay. Now, here's the, here's the question that fascinates me, uh, Dr. Medford. We have these two very distinctive lives um, in a period of time in which these kinds of lives were not supposed to come and right. to even meet, much less uh -huh. uh, you know, to join. How do the two come into contact? Uh -huh. And how, what's that point at, the, at which the fulcrum switches and swings, rather, and we uh -huh. get them uh -huh. joining? Hinson was working in a store. He was 21 or 22 years old. Uh -huh. And uh, Perry comes in to, to get supplies. He's on his way to Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. He's mm -hmm. talking to the store owner, and the store owner says, you know, if you're looking for someone to assist you, uh, you know, a, a personal assistant, you know, I've got this young man here who might be useful to you. Mm -hmm. He offers Henson the job. Henson takes it on, and he's so great at it when they're in the jungles of Nicaragua mm -hmm. that Perry thinks of him when mm -hmm. he decides that he's going to make that second trip. Uh, attempt mm -hmm. to the North Pole. Now, this is a, uh, a portion of the story that's um, almost novelistic in a sense, and because it seems to me there's something in the chemistry here mm -hmm. uh, must begin to change dramatically in Perry's mind. I mean, here he has a man who is not supposed to be capable of what he's doing, mm -hmm. and because from the Nicaragua uh, expedition onward, they're going to, he's going to insist on having absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, uh, what's your sense of what? Perry's sense of discovery, if you will, of Henson. Mm -hmm. but, but I think that's the irony of race relations in the United States in the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. It may be easy for white Americans to say that African Americans are inferior, but they know that they're not. Mm -hmm. They know. Mm -hmm. And so when it's to their advantage, they will perhaps not openly acknowledge it, but use that expertise. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think that the men are that different, actually. They certainly come from very different backgrounds, mm -hmm. but I think the two men really understood each other. Mm -hmm. They were very ambitious, they were very courageous, and I think what Perry saw in Henson was the same courage and the same ambition that he saw in himself. Mm -hmm. And I think because of that, he was able to put the, the racial issue mm -hmm. aside for a moment, because it does come back, you know. It's, yeah. it's never gone for very long, apparently. And this is why the story is so fast. I, I, that's, a, if I may say so, a, a wonderful answer. Uh, because, it, it, well, if I can embroider on or at least ed, uh, editorialize this <laughs> at the moment, the, the, it was a society that knew it was living a contradiction. Absolutely. That knew Absolutely. it at Indeed. that time. Indeed. And then Always when they're faced have. on it in a kind of individual way, mm -hmm. part of them says, you know, we, I just can't go on with this nonsense. I need mm -hmm. this man. Right. Absolutely. Uh, uh -huh. He understood what would be successful, and he was more than willing to put race aside yeah. for that purpose. And they did become friends for yeah. a time. For a time. It, I mean, it's almost the stuff of, as I say, novels or movies. But at the point at which uh, this union is formed, this friendship is formed, in addition to Matthew Henson's uh, mathematical, scientific, navigational skills, there are also questions of personality that he brings to everything that happens later that I think are important. Now, I only know the shorthand, uh, and I look to you now for an explanation, but he seems to be a very calm, uh, humane character. Very. 
Very, uh -huh. absolutely. Uh, he has a tremendous rapport with the Inuit, uh, right. gu not guides, but their, their mm -hmm. assistants. Mm -hmm. uh, he learns their language. He learns to live like them. Mm -hmm. He embraces them as brothers. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because of that 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 last expedition is so successful. Right. Had, had he not had that relationship with the four Inuit men, or the rest of them as well, who go with them, mm -hmm. uh, and four of them do end up at the pole, mm -hmm. uh, that expedition may not have been very successful at all. Right. Uh, and I think that what you say is true in, in, in two senses. That expedition, and there were several attempts, mm -hmm. the two of them made uh, to, to get to the North Pole, uh, was successful largely because of Henson's navigational skills, but also because of this com uh, compatibility Absolutely. that he would have with uh, the Inuit, which is still remembered today. It's interesting that these two men have descendants there. Indeed, yeah. they uh -huh. both do. That's uh -huh. right. Yeah. And the descendants are very proud of that connection right. because they see them both as great men. And they, they were, indeed yeah. they were, yeah. but so were the Inuit men who went as well. I, I am bothered uh, to a great extent by the fact that the Inuit men who arrived there haven't gotten a great deal of attention. That's and well said. It reminds me of Tenzing Norke who went up with Edmund Hillary to the top of Everest mm -hmm. and took some exactly. time for people to realize he was even there. Mm -hmm. so, exactly. And of course, when, uh, again, without going on the great length, we, we talk about discovering the pole. The, the Eskimos knew it was there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they may not have ever been there. They hadn't gotten there. Right. But they certainly did. Uh, yeah. They were aware of the climate. I mean, they knew so much about yeah. how to live on the ice. Yeah. And uh, it's because of their expertise, I think, that that was so successful. And we always need to remember the role that we'll, those we'll men We'll come back played. to this toward the end of our conversation, but I think it, it bears some emphasis right now. As a historian, uh, what you're saying right now suggests to me you think there's a, there's a glaring need for greater inclusiveness in the stories we learn about ourselves. Absolutely. In America. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Indeed. Indeed. Mm -hmm. There are so many varieties of people who have participated in our history or who have done things that make our history look better, mm -hmm. and we do need to include all of those people. Yeah, well, that's, I think it's one of the major points of this conversation. On the 6th of April, 1909, the men arrive, and here is a pivotal point in every sense. Uh, by arrive, I, of course, mean at the, at the North Pole, mm -hmm. and it's Ben Henson's calculations, of course, that have determined this. Now, here's a key point that I'd love for you, you to discuss, because you've, you've stated that their friendship develops tensions. Mm -hmm. And in this moment of triumph, we see, I think Henson actually arrives 45 minutes before. Supposedly. Supposedly. I, and, and I'm not certain about that uh -huh. uh, because Henson's autobiography does not admit to that. Uh -huh. Peary certainly does not admit to that. Right. But there is, legend has it, that uh -huh. Henson and two of the Inuit did arrive 45 minutes before Perry, that they were told to advance but to stop short of the pole. But didn't stop. And Henson says he accidentally, apparently Henson is saying he accidentally reached the pole. Yeah. Now, if he did reach the pole before Perry, I can tell you it was no accident. Yeah. <laughs> because I don't think that as, as mild-mannered as he was, uh -huh. I don't think that he would have been willing to give up that opportunity of being the first man to Well, that ties there. back to what you said earlier about the two of them being brothers under the skin in, in terms of ambition and such, Absolutely. that they would have done that. Now, here's some points about this, because this friendship does, uh, at some point, sour. It does, right after. Right after this, right after, right after, after this, because, <laughs> and, and, and the one theory was that it had something to do with the, the arrival times. Mm -hmm. But then also, uh, Matthew Henson took something like 110 photographs mm -hmm. that he handed over to Perry. Right and uh, but never could get them back right. from Perry. Right, right. And, and he's told not to write anything And he does, but he does it. write he something. He does. And, and so and what Perry happens? actually does an introduction to the, to the book. Though. He does have a foreword mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. but they're, they're never, the relationship is never the same mm -hmm. after they reach the pole. And in fact, Henson says after they reach the pole, Perry begins to treat him as if he is a servant, not mm -hmm. as if he's a friend. And before that, they seem to be equal in this partnership. Mm. But after they reached the pole, apparently Perry didn't even speak to him on the way back to the ship. What is So there must have been some problem in reaching the pole. Yeah. You know, clearly, uh, Henson yeah. must have gotten there first. And, but the true nature of this story, in a sense, went to the grave, didn't it? Because it did, absolutely. It's still a mystery, mm -hmm. in a sense. Indeed, uh -huh. indeed. And I don't know that it really does matter who got there first. Mm -hmm. The point is, they all got there yeah. because they had worked together. Yeah. Now, after they got there, and of course, after they came back, their, their lives again diverge, and not just because of any uh, underlying enmity, 
uh, it's a question of recognition and afterlife. So, and what's right. that like? I mean, I, well, well, initially, Perry's not even recognized because another man, Frederick Cook, says mm -hmm. he had actually reached the pole a year before. Right. And so it takes some time for Perry to actually get the recognition that he does. But he certainly gets the accolades long before Henson does. Mm -hmm. In fact, Henson is not really recognized until after Perry dies. Mm -hmm. And um, even then, it's rather slow. I, I, I love the idea, though, that the African-American community embraces him immediately. You know, they see Henson as a hero. I I want, to, I want to talk about that point, uh, but let's go back uh, uh, for a moment to that the, the question of the controversy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Frederick Cook that you mentioned, uh, I think, had been with him in something earlier. Yes, the, he had the, been on early expeditions. And mm -hmm. he's a bit of a character. Very much so. Yeah, a con man, really. <laughs> yes, uh -huh. absolutely. So, so, that, so the, the whole thing has a kind of a, is shrouded in controversy for a long period of time. And Cook still had, Cook had his supporters uh -huh. because, he, because he was a bit more charismatic than Perry was. Yeah. And people wanted to believe that exactly. he had arrived before Perry. And he sold the story. He went around lecturing exactly. and making money on it. Absolutely. But the effect of that was, that I think, Perry dies in 1920, and mm -hmm. then Henson. Mm -hmm. That's right. Not 55, until 55. 55. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but it did take a long time for the, the public to accept. It certainly did. In official circles, to accept absolutely. This. That second point you made is also extremely important. The the effect of all of this on the African American community. I'd love to get you expound on that. I think it's true that Henson himself wrote that. Frederick Douglass inspired him. Yes, absolutely, uh -huh. and so, understandably so. Right, <laughs> right. I mean, Douglass was the guy, you yeah. know, during that that earlier period. Certainly, Douglass was was dead by the time that uh, the pole is conquered. Mm -hmm. But but certainly, he had had a tremendous influence over African Americans throughout mm -hmm. the second half of the 19th century. So it's not at all surprising that Henson would have been influenced by Douglass. So, it to, and to carry the chain forward, Henson is influenced by Douglas. Henson writes his autobiography. The world doesn't pay that much attention immediately. Mm -hmm. But African Americans do. To, with oh, what, to what effect? What ways? I mean, what happens? They're having dinners for him. They have a parade for him. Howard University uh, uh, confers an honorary Master of Science degree on him in 1939. Morgan State does as well. Mm -hmm. um, a school, one of the schools in, in Louisiana, in Louisiana, I believe, names a hall after him. Mm -hmm. And then you've got all of the elementary schools and so forth in Maryland that are named after him, at least a few are. Mm -hmm. So he does eventually eventually get that kind of attention. I mean, he does immediately from African Americans. You have mm -hmm. Booker T. Washington doing the introduction to um, a true. Negro explorer at the North Pole, Henson's mm -hmm. autobiography. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get any better than that no, when the not. leader no. of African Americans you know, introduces your autobiography. Absolutely. So this is a man who does get significant recognition. Absolutely. But no jobs. But no, no, not, no not jobs. Not really significant jobs. No. Now, this is interesting. He struggles. He struggles after he gets back. And he dies in relative poverty. Oh. So, um, no, not, not, he's certainly not doing as well as he should have done. Right. Yeah, that's a very interesting fact because one of the later images I have of him is meeting Eisenhower mm -hmm. in the White mm -hmm. House. At the White House, yes, just before just, he died. Just before he died. And he, he's a very attractive man, very handsome man, mm -hmm. standing there with his wife, I believe, and mm -hmm. the president. But that didn't translate into... And, and he was an older man by that time, mm -hmm. though, mm -hmm. because he died at 88. Mm -hmm. But he, really, he was 42 when he went to the pole. So, um, and although we wouldn't think that's old, you know, well, it might time. be considered yeah. rather old at that time. Right. And he got some, some minor jobs, but there mm -hmm. wasn't anything that was worthy of what he had accomplished. Yeah. As you suggested earlier, um, Dr. Medford, as we come uh, toward the end of our conversation, there's a larger story, too, in all of this, and that is the story of unacknowledged participation, Absolutely. Uh, particularly by, by uh, minority peoples and, uh, in a sense, African-American peoples in much of our history. I even think, uh, and may correct me if this is wrong, but I believe I heard that Columbus had um, black navigators, or at least a, a, a crew um, members. I think we can say family with some certainty that there were people of African descent in just about every exploration that ever occurred. Mm -hmm. And so there would have been, um, black men were seamen for, for long, long periods of time before, you know, we even 
think about the founding of America. Right. And so uh, with, with a lot of those early voyages to mm -hmm. America, you have black men who are somehow involved. Mm -hmm. They may not be in charge, but right. they certainly are But they involved. are there, and mm -hmm. no one on a ship can be extra cargo. You have to Absolutely. pull your weight, oh, so to speak. Indeed you do, yeah. right. indeed. In terms of pulling one's weight, and history pulling its weight, in terms of telling the true story, I'd love to have you give us your sense of uh, what needs to be done to make the, the story. I mean, there, there, to me, the real lesson here is that people like Matthew Henson should not be forgotten. Right. That right. is important for African American history, but that's just part of a bigger history mm -hmm. that everyone has to mm -hmm. grasp. Exactly. So. And, and I think we, we do that by making sure that African American history is included in the schools. Because, you know, I have students that I teach. I teach a course in African American history at Howard, and my students tell me this is the first time I've heard any of this because mm -hmm. our schools didn't include any of this. There's a unit on slavery, and that's it, mm. you know. And that's a shame because African American history is American history. Right. And we all need to know American history. That's very well said. And in that sense, um, as you and I, have, I've had the pleasure of talking with you earlier about the African slave burial grounds mm -hmm. in New York mm -hmm. City. And other, I've always felt that slavery, and Matthew Henson was not a slave, and his, his parents would be born, but clearly slavery has been mm -hmm. the, the dominant mm -hmm. theme. So that as a, as a phenomenon in American society has really never been fully mm -hmm. grasped by the larger history. No, no, it has not. And we certainly do need to do something about that because it really does affect today's relationships. Mm -hmm. Are you encouraged that things are being done? Uh, on any given day. <laughs> uh -huh. You know, it changes from time to time. I am very encouraged by some things I see, and then, you know, the next day, it just seems that it's not happening quickly enough. Mm -hmm. I think we need to start a very serious dialogue, very serious dialogue. We need to acknowledge what has happened. We need to acknowledge what still needs to be done. And mm -hmm. until we're willing to sit down and deal with those things, the country's going to be it's not going to be able to go forward in a way that we know it can. And we all care deeply about this country. We want it to be successful for all of us. And I think we can have that if we're willing to talk these things through. That's a wonderful statement. I appreciate that. And I really appreciate this conversation. It's always fun to have it's you It's my here. pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Matt. Thank you. And that's our program. We appreciate your comments. And you can reach us at dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. I'm George liston CA, and you've been watching Dialogue, a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHC Networks. Dialogue's also on the MHC Worldview Channel, which is available to public TV stations nationwide. For more information, go to www.mhcworldview.org. Please join us again right here next week, and thank you for watching. And thank you, Dr. Oh, thank you so much. It was really good.